just, I'd just like to thank um, the AGDA committee for letting me speak here today and for the opportunity to present a talk without wearing any pants. So my name's Torsten and I'm a bioinformatician and I work at the Doherty Institute in the public health lab. So the Doherty Institute really are coming together of groups at the University of Melbourne and the Royal Melbourne Hospital and the building's kind of this synergistic institute where we have public health and reference labs, we have Department of Microbiology and Immunology teaching and research, diagnostic services and other clinical care services. So it's quite an exciting place to um, work at and it's sort of the hub of the COVID-19 response in Victoria. And we at the Doherty love genomics, we always have, and we've got lots of toys. For, the, for those of you who can see the bottom right-hand corner, recognize that that's our old pack bio, which has currently just been retired, unfortunately. So he's just fading into white there. So as I said, I worked sort of, I was tr traditionally in research only, but I've kind of moved over into the public health and clinical microbiology space. I've always been in bacteria. So I guess the roles of a public health laboratory are sort of threefold. So there's diagnostics, there's surveillance. So keeping an eye on what's lurking out there. And our sort of core business is traditionally food safety, things like salmonella and listeria. And then when, you know, the thing, when the stuff hits the fan, the outbreak response. And the outbreak response is what we'll sort of be talking about today in terms of COVID. So Victoria's had quite a good response to COVID-19. So early on, um, Viteral, which is part of the Doherty Institute, um, they were the first place in the world to culture the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And um, that I found out just this week that that's now used internationally as a control by many commercial vendors. Um, we're helping Viteral and MDU are doing a lot of the sort of testing that you would get. If some of you might have been to your GP and got a test or gone to a drive through at Chadston Shopping Centre or something. And, you know, our test, where testing is pretty good and it's pretty fast, 12 to 24 hour response time. But the main thing that I'm here to talk about is how the decision was made by the public health labs here in Victoria to just sequence every PCR positive sample we got. And this is not something that's commonly been done or even done in Australia, but to our credit, our Department of Health agreed with us and our boss, Ben Howden, went ahead and made it happen. So, so far we've had about 1,500 cases in Victoria and we've sequenced nearly all of them. And we're using an, an Illumina protocol with the uh, Illumina sequencing with the Arctic protocol that's already been referred to a bit. And we've done a bit of iron torrent sequencing early on as well. And we're also assisting some of the other states as required with sequencing urgent cases. So I guess I wanted to talk about how, what actually happens a little bit, how we go from that sequence to, how we go from the genome sequencing to some actual useful data. So I guess traditionally I am definitely not a virologist. I've dabbled in a bit of virology over the years, but never been a true viral genomics bioinformatician. So the last, the last eight weeks has been a, an intensive learning uh, learning sequence for me in sort of how things are different. So traditionally I work in bacterial gen genomes and I'll never complain about them again because viral genomics, you know, it's got a, it's a lot, lot trickier. So bacteria are kind of easy. You kind of get a sample, grow it on some media, pick a colony, make a library, chuck it in the sequencer, sequence it to about a hundred fold depth, get some reads, assemble it, and you get most of your genome there. Sure, it's in contigs and bits, but you get most of your genome and everything's you know, quite reasonable. But viral genomic, genomics proved to be quite a different beast. Um, there, were some, uh, there are some protocols you can do when you culture a virus to do whole genome sequencing, but because viruses, because it's hard to culture, we don't do it that way. So what we do is what others have already referred to as this tiled amplicon sequencing. So basically the RNA is converted into cDNA and then that, CD, bit, that cDNA is sort of broken into amplicons, so chunks, and then each of those chunks is sequenced. Now, you can see at the bottom of this diagram here that there's all these little squares. Those, are, those represent the 96 amplicon in the Arctic protocol. And you can see that the amplicons all slightly overlap and they're in two pools there. So they're kind of done in two batches and then combined. So you get less sort of primer dimers and other problems. So it's a multiplex RT and RT-PCR. And I guess it's quite different to bacterial sequencing because 
that plot there is a log scale plot of the depth of sequencing and it's all over the shop. So unlike a bacterial genome or traditional whole genome sequencing where you kind of get uniform coverage across your genome, here we definitely don't. And you get regions where you get no sequencing whatsoever and there's all sorts of other challenges to do with primers and other issues like that. But once we get those reads, where we were traditionally de novo assemble, we don't. We align to a reference genome. And the reason this works well is because there actually isn't much diversity in this virus. And so aligning to this reference won't mean we're not going to miss anything. That's not there. And we can pick up mo even sort of minor structural changes and relatively large deletions. So the first thing we have to do is you can't just go and align the reads as is. Well, actually, you do align the reads as is, but you can't use them as is. Because there's primers involved in these bits of DNA, these primers are, are, are synthetic and they're non-template DNA and they can bind to the amplicons at less than 100% identity. So because they are sequenced as the, pr the primers of the thing actually being sequenced, not what they attach to, you need to ma make sure you mask those first. Once you've done that, you do then just call variants essentially and build a consensus genome. And any missing parts kind of end up as ambiguous DNA nucleotides, these runs of ends in the sequence. So well, how does the result differ from traditional bacterial sequencing? Well, one, you don't recover 100% of the genome. And here to the right, we have a graph of our, all our samples and how many of them we recovered 100, close to 100% and so on. You can see that most of them were recovered well, but there's a significant number that we did not recover much of the genome and a significant number down here, probably 100 or so that recovered no genome. These were often the, uh, samples that had low viral load and hence a very high CT and they didn't just got no reads back whatsoever. Another problem is that because there's very little diversity in the sequence um, and there is PCR artifacts and other sequencing noise, the, the signal to noise ratio is quite low. So it's very easy for some sort of artifacts to interfere with your analysis because they can look like SNPs but and there's, there could be just as many artifacts as SNPs. And the other different thing is that unlike bacteria or human where you sort of might sequence an individual, often a virus could be a mixed infection where there's sort of subpopulations. And when you, when you analyze them in here, you'll get base positions where you can't call a distinct base, you get a mixture. And you can either sort of just call the majority or you might call ambiguous bases. So we've done this for all our samples and now we want to use the genomes to do something useful. Well, the first thing we kind of do is multiple, multiple sequence alignment, which means aligning all our genomes against each other and including the reference. We don't, we don't align to the reference like we do short reads. We're sort of jointly, they're all first class citizens in this alignment. Every sequence is a first class citizen and they are aligned sort of jointly. And this is a very computationally challenging problem. And it does not scale very well at all. And um, you can see the time complexity down there. That's the official time complexity for an MSA of n sequences of length L, and that's for an optimal alignment. But you know these sequences are very similar, and they're not varying in length much. So you know you, it, you can do it more efficiently, but it still does not really scale to the thousands and tens of thousands of genomes that the world is generating at the moment. But there are sort of heuristics and hacks you can do to sort of still do it, and we do. Once you've got that alignment, the main thing we do in um, public health is build a phylogenomic tree, which itself is also got its own computational challenges that do not scale with N very well at all. And the sort of multiple types of trees you might design as evolutionary trees where these branch lengths here of this plot of the Australian diversity of COVID is, or there's timed trees where this, the distance is more about the time between when it was acquired and where it is now. And these trees are used to sort of describe and evaluate the relationship between things so we can make decisions about possible transmission and about possible common source. Okay, so now I'm gonna sort of give some examples of you know, how this has helped. In, but first we have to sort of say what, is, what, what came before us. And before us, there was epidemiology and there still is epidemiology and it's still very important. So epidemiology is sort of the process of like, tracking down the samples, interviewing the patients, finding out where they've been, who they've had contact with, building up contact maps and travel maps and stuff like that. And um, it's, it, it is pretty good, but there's a couple of problems, well, not problems with it, but challenges with the data they get. People have bad memories. 
people lie because you know they don't want to be caught out. They might have been doing something a bit questionable, and they don't won't tell the interviewer that they went somewhere. Um, and it's also a lot of dead ends, and so that's all. It's quite labour intensive, and the more we can minimise those dead ends, the better. So. We've been helping DHHS, where the epidemia just primarily exists, with their investigations by using the genomics I've just described. So some of the things we've been doing, I can't, unfortunately can't give you any details about any particular cases, but you're all aware of things in the media, such as you know, cedar meats and things like that. That's the things we are working on. And it's actually, I've never really dealt much with the epidemiology. It's quite a bit of, it's quite exciting to sort of find out some of the gossip and stuff that's going on behind the scenes about who went where and that. So that's been quite a, a sort of an interesting part of this new viral role. So some of the things we've done is clarify transmissions in sort of hospitals and work sites and between patients and healthcare workers. And obviously we've we can identify community transmission and a bit harder, but we can identify sources of unknown acquisition. Normally that's very hard, but because Victoria is sampling every positive case, Although we're not actually sampling every positive because we're not testing everybody, we certainly have more data in this pan in this app pandemic and outbreak than we've ever had before. So it's really this combination of bioinformatics and epidemiology which sort of gives you the, the, the multiplicative power here. So some of the types of cases we've we've resolved is sort of this multiple exposure clarification say a healthcare worker at a hospital was infected and it's not clear whether they got it. There was epi data that suggested it could have come from a patient at the hospital because there was patients with it, or it come, could have come from some social event that they attended where someone at that social event had it. So the epi can't resolve those, but once you do the genomics, you know, the SNPs don't lie. Um, the other thing that commonly happens is there might be an ep epidemiological cluster. So interviewing links all these people at being somewhere at the same time. And it seemed like one group, but when you go and analyze it at the genomic level, it clearly is divided into one, two or more genomic clusters. And then we can, then they can go back and interview people and sort of tease out the, the truth there. Because now they have cluster assignments they can use. The other thing is you can merge these epi clusters. I, you see these two separate epi clusters, one might be a cruise ship, one might be a party, and then you see that they all cluster together on the genomic tree. And then this, you find that there was, some mis there was a patient who you never really knew about, and you find their genome is the same as those two groups, and they were sort of the missing link. And the epi can go back and investigate and explain this. And this happens every week, has happened every week in this outbreak. And um, working together with the department's been very exciting, and both sides are happy, and produce, you know, just, it's really uh, streamlined the, the handling of the outbreak. And I guess the, the, one of the most interesting ones actually is this, the idea of breaches of protective equipment that the healthcare workers are using. So there's, you know, we've been able to show that there's likely been some kind of transmission between the patient being treated and the healthcare workers, whether it be doctor or nurse. And despite, them being very careful and having what's called trained spotters. These are other healthcare workers which actually just are like eagle eyes who watch the worker as they disrobe and change their equipment. And they can't spot anything weird going on, yet there was some kind of transmission. And so this has led to infection control procedures being changed and also changes in PPE equipment use and even types of PPE. So that was sort of the success, success, success stories we've had with the uh, genomics combining with the epi. And the other exciting thing, which I sort of have helped to drive, but have had great support from the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services and the people at the Doherty, is that we are sharing all our data. We have been sharing all our data from the start. Our consensus genomes have been going into Gazade, which, you're, which is sort of a national semi-public repository of Genomes traditionally used for flu, now using now for SARS. Um, all our Illumina reads and some nanopore reads, which we've done, are in NCBI, uh, in SRA, and also we've had a bit of trouble getting some of our genomes because of potential frame shift problems. So all our genomes are also on GitHub, including our alignments and our trees. And part of this. 
part of this uh, outbreak has highlighted one of the projects we've been working on slowly over the last few years is called OzTracker, which is an online system for sort of Australian public health labs to share, analyze their data in real time and find sort of matches between outbreaks across state boundaries. As you know, in Australia, health is a state, state issue. So it's often been a bit tricky to sort of interact with interstate colleagues. So we've been developing this system and COVID has just highlighted the need for this system to be uh, built more quickly. Now you say, I oh, want if you just make all the data free and open, then we can do this already. Well, there's some reason that you can't share some data. Just there's legal issues, if there's criminal investigations, we just can't share it. If it's private data from industry, we can't share it publicly, but we can share it within the public health network and still improve sort of health outcomes in um, inter multi-jurisdictional outbreaks. So I'll just finish up here. Um, conclusions, genomics is definitely no longer optional. These arguments have still been held out a little bit, but I think everyone is in total agreement now that in our field, genomics is no longer optional. There's lots of evidence saying it pays for itself with better health outcomes. There's less labor intensive investigation on the epi side, which is really more of a human side. There's, it's hard to put machine sequencing. There's no machinery or robots you can put into that side of the process. And faster clarification of outbreaks, which means outbreaks tend to be shorter and outbreaks tend to be less, uh, tend to be smaller and shorter. And I guess the big thing was that sequencing all positives, we've built up this very large repository of good epi data combined with good genomic data, which has with a large sampling percentage of the population. So we think this data set is actually going to be a source of a source of data for lots of phylogenomic analyses in the future and hopefully have some utility in future pandemics and this pandemic. Well, a lot of people went into the work that I've just talked about. So there's the public health labs here, there's the Victorian State Government, Department of Health and Human Services, the Office of Health Protection, the Commonwealth Government's been supportive, local hospitals, local pathology service, my, the state interstate labs and the New Zealand partner labs, as you saw Duke talk before earlier, we've discussed stuff, we all talk together on Slack, um, colleagues locally and around the world. I was quite new to viral genomics and I just went and put out feelers and asked questions of everyone I knew who knew anything. And they were all very helpful in giving me tips and tricks on how to actually start processing your data because Victoria was pretty, pretty fast off the mark and we were sort of sequencing stuff before most of the traditional international places. So I really had no one to copy. I had to sort of get advice from my friends and colleagues everywhere. And of course, NCBI and Gazade for being sort of curators of this data. Um, that's it. Thank you.